Welcome to the Capital Forum 6th Annual Antitrust Thought Leaders Interview Series sponsored by KL Discovery. My name is Ashley Chang and I'm joined here today by C with Cassandra Brown of Blake Castles in Graydon, one of Canada's top business law firms. So Cassie, today I wanted to discuss um, Canada's antitrust regime and the differences with that in other jurisdictions. So, High level, what are some of the key differences between competition law in Canada versus in other countries? Sure. Um, so I would say as overall as a starting point, Canada's antitrust regime is probably uh, most similar to the United States. Um, that said, there are still some key both procedural and substantive uh, differences. Um, one thing that is unique to Canada from a procedural perspective is that all civil, which is to say non-criminal antitrust matters, are adjudicated by the Competition Tribunal, which is a sort of specialized court uh, that's comprised of federal court judges as well as economists. Um, substantively, I think we'll probably talk a little bit more in detail about the, the merger process specifically, uh, which has converged with that of the US over time. Um, a, another substantive difference that we notice quite a bit on a day-to-day -day basis is the application of vertical restraints in Canada and specifically there's been quite limited enforcement uh, of vertical restraint provisions over the past uh, you know decade I would say and um, in particular uh, resale price maintenance in Canada was decriminalized about a decade ago and so in counseling matters we often find uh, the we run up against the difference uh, in the United States versus Canada where people uh, need to take a much more conservative approach in the United States whereas in Canada now that it's a civil provision and um, and it, it's really only addressable by an injunction um, people are more willing to uh, to enforce resale price maintenance policies in Canada um, so I, I would say that in, with respect to um, to vertical restraints. Obviously, on the criminal side, um, cartels are a criminal offense uh, in Canada, unlike in some jurisdictions, but that's uh, not as much a difference with the US versus a difference uh, with Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned that there were some differences in the merger review process. So procedurally, what, what are those differences? Right, so um, in Canada, it has converged significantly with the US process. Um, we do have the, the two-stage review now, so there's an initial 30 calendar day waiting period uh, following which uh, if the Competition Bureau wants to take a more in-depth uh, look at a merger, they will issue what's called a supplementary information request or a SIR. Um, that's akin to a second request in the United States. Um, one, one difference in how companies typically respond to those second requests in Canada um, is that in the United States, uh, often where a transaction is clearly headed for a remedy, parties will avoid responding to parts of, of the second request or in some cases avoid responding to the second request at all um, in order to move the discussion directly to the remedies phase. Um, in Canada, it hasn't really developed that way. Um, people still tend to comply in full with the supplementary information request and then if, remedi if remedies um, are required they'll then begin talking about remedies after that. Um, another thing that we sometimes come up against in cross-border mergers is um, there is extensive cooperation between the Canadian and US agencies and so sometimes that can be challenging to manage from a timing perspective. Um, in particular, we have seen cases where there are cross-border trade flows or there's a pattern of um, utilization of assets in a supply chain that crosses Canadian and US borders. Um, and we have seen uh, Canadian agency, well, we've seen the Bureau be reluctant to get out in front of the US agencies and sign off on a remedy where they feel that the US agency's consideration of the transaction and potential remedies has the potential to conflict with, um, with their remedy. And so from our perspective, sometimes that 
can be uh, challenging just in terms of managing the client's expectations on timing and when um, when they can expect to receive clearance or approval of a remedy um, in Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then substantively, I have seen that the standard in Canada and the U.S. Uh, is both substantial lessening of competition. So, in are there any differences uh, in how that standard is applied? I, I would say broadly, no. Um, the the one thing is in Canada. Uh, just in terms of what the process is for going through the application of the SLC test, um, Canada obviously uh, has a, a, a statutory um, efficiencies defense. Um, and so the way that works, the, the test is that where the expected efficiencies from a transaction um, outweigh and offset the likely anti-competitive effects of a transaction, um, under the statute, the competition tribunal cannot block that merger, um, mm -hmm. and and that is a, a, a substantive difference from um, from most other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that that works in practice with the SLC test is that um, the bureau can conduct the SLC test and conclude that there will be a likely substantial lessening of competition um, and then at that point they have to do the trade-off between the anti-competitive effects that they expect to result and the anticipated uh, efficiencies that will be realized from the transaction. Mm -hmm. Okay and in the US we have you know the FTC and the DOJ as antitrust enforcers and you mentioned that in Canada there's the tribunal so can yeah. you uh, describe the other actors uh, that enforce sure. antitrust in Canada? Yeah. Um, so the, the Competition Act in Canada is a federal statute. There's uh, one regulator for Canada, that's the Canadian Competition Bureau. Um, the Canadian Competition Bureau are the investigators. They are the ones who receive merger filings. Um, they carry out criminal investigations. They carry out civil investigations. So they investigate abuse of dominance complaints or potentially they can investigate joint ventures. Um, and, and then for civil, uh, for civil matters, um, which is to say merger matters, abuse of dominance, um, vertical restraints provisions, um, the commissioner of competition who heads the competition bureau uh, can apply to the competition tribunal for an order. Um, that's, on the, that's on the civil side. And then on the criminal side, uh, with respect to um, cartels and bid rigging offenses, um, the Competition Bureau will interface with the PPSC, which is the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, and um, the prosecutors will bring the criminal uh, will bring criminal charges before the court system, which okay. is not the not the uh, Competition Tribunal, but the regular criminal courts. Oh, okay. Canada. Got it. Um, and I had seen that there will be new leadership at the Competition Bureau this year. So what are the implications of that change in leadership? Right. So yes, as you, uh, as you allude to, um, the current Commissioner of Competition, John Peckman, uh, is set to retire at the expiry of his current term, which is uh, in June of this year. Um, He's actually the first uh, non-lawyer to lead the Canada's Competition Bureau. He's an economist uh, by training. Um, and uh, so I, I think that the odds are that, um, that the new commissioner will probably be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, so the search for the new commissioner, I think, kicked off officially last week. Um, and there may be a period. Uh, there may be a, a period where there's an interim commissioner, which is what happened the last time there was a change in the permanent commissioner. Um, and I think, in terms of what it means for enforcement going forward, so there, there could first of all, there could be this interim period of time where someone uh, is appointed as the interim commissioner, and that person could either become the, the permanent commissioner, um, which is what happened in the case of of our current commissioner, who was an interim commissioner prior to um, to being appointed, um, or it could be someone different. Uh, that that could have an effect on um, on pending cases. And then once the permanent commissioner is appointed, 
Um, I think that any shift will probably be more subtle. I don't expect anything dramatic, although I think that it will depend upon who is ultimately appointed to the position. Um, it, it is a political appointment, um, but that said, there's also a, a history in Canada of, um, of appointing people who are highly qualified and have deep experience with um, either practicing or enforcing Canadian competition law, mm -hmm. or both. Okay. Do, do enforcement priorities change very drastically from one commissioner to the next, or are, you know, is it kind of like you're seeing more of a subtle shift? Yeah, I, w I would say overall um, it's probably a little bit more subtle. Um, I think that one thing that the current uh, commissioner has been focused on is um, he, he's, he's definitely advocated for uh, the introduction of competition in certain sectors of the economy where there might have been regulation. So for example, um, the Bureau has been out uh, playing sort of more of an advocacy role um, and writing papers uh, about topics that are of current importance, for example, the introduction of um, uh, Uber and similar services to compete with, um, with city taxi services across Canada, um, and, and has proactively gone out into the business community and taken on that advocacy role. Um, where he felt that there was the potential to introduce competition into sectors, sometimes regulated sectors. Um, so, th so that has been a uh, that has been a priority for the uh, for the current commissioner. Um, something else that has probably been more prominent since the last um, federal election in Canada. Is in 2016, uh, there was a new Liberal government elected and. And following that election, the um, the ministry that oversees the Competition Bureau, which used to be called the Ministry of Industry, uh, changed its name to the um, Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. So um, in connection with that change and the priorities of the current government, um, I think innovation has definitely become a buzzword at the, at the Competition Bureau. Um, I wouldn't expect the Competition Bureau to ever change course in saying that they uh, don't have innovation as a, as a priority, but that is right. definitely something notable that, that we've seen in the past uh, couple of years coming from the, coming from the Bureau. And um, I, I think that there are some things that will just remain constant as priorities for the Bureau. Um, and, and for example, one of those things is that the Bureau uh, has always articulated a, pr a strong preference for um, prioritizing uh, enforcement of the criminal cartel provisions and bid rigging provisions, um, and I think that's a, a pretty uh, easy sell for them because those are the uh, offenses that most obviously harm competition in Canada, and they uh, seek to to um, to make an impact in those areas in the Canadian economy. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular industries that um, are of, <clears throat> I guess, pr a particular focus for the Bureau? We tend to see the Bureau devoting a lot of time to uh, industries where I think they feel that their message or their, their uh, enforcement um, will be uh, appreciated by uh, Canadians generally. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those tend to be consumer-facing industries. Um, as always, the, the, the Bureau has remained active in the telecommunications sector. Um, they've also uh, made a, a priority out of investigating things like grocery retail. Um, there's, there was a, a long-running abuse of dominance case that the Bureau uh, spent a lot of resources uh, on, uh, they, they were investigating that sector for years and it, it was obviously important to them. They made some speeches about it. Um, and, and just generally, I think industries that are seen as, um, as being important to Canada and Canadian uh, consumers historically uh, 
there, there also has been an emphasis on, for example, gas retail, so retail gasoline, um, and, and, and other things that are just prominent, uh, prominent issues for everyday Canadians. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in the U.S., you know, we're seeing somewhat of a shift in how the antitrust agencies approach vertical merger enforcement. Um, have you seen any similar shift in Canada or anything along those lines? I think the bureaus, um, you know, going in position has always been that they're skeptical of something that's labeled as a behavioral remedy. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I, I do think that, um, that there certainly have been uh, behavioral aspects of remedies over the years, and I, I haven't seen you know, in the last year or so, a dramatic change in in the application of that. Um, you know, anecdotally, I, I have seen a few instances where the bureau, again, has has expressed skepticism uh, with respect to something that they characterized as a vert as a behavioral remedy, um, and and potentially to address something that could be characterized as a vertical concern. Um, but, but I don't necessarily see that as, I don't necessarily see the Bureau's response um, as being different because it's 2017 or now 2018 um, compared to what it would have been three or four years ago or five years ago. Okay. Um, are there any other trends in, uh, in antitrust enforcement that you've been observing? One thing that we have been keeping a close eye on um, is the, the Bureau is currently, re, I don't, mm, don't want to say redesigning, <laughs> they're, they're tweaking their um, immunity and leniency programs. Um, and so we have been following those developments. Uh, the Bureau is expected to release uh, sometime within the next month or so uh, a revised um, bulletin that will explain the application of their leniency and uh, immunity programs um, and uh, and that I think will be something that we will um, be paying close attention to uh, it, to see whether we th what we think the effect of that is going to be and whether um, there are certain changes being proposed because what's released will be a draft for consultation so the Bureau will be seeking feedback um, and so I think we'll be looking to see whether any of the proposed changes um, in our view are likely to uh, chill companies' willingness to approach the Bureau and participate in the immunity and leniency um, programs. Uh, so that, that's something that we'll be keeping an, an eye on in the next month or so. The, the Bureau, just on the topic of, of um, consultation papers, the Bureau has also released recently um, a draft uh, bulletin that explains how the Bureau uh, how the Bureau will apply the efficiencies defense to uh, mergers in Canada. And again, that's something else that we're keeping tabs on and that we're um, providing feedback on as it's a draft for consultation and can be very important to our clients uh, who are looking to do mergers and oftentimes when they pertain to Canada, um, just due to the nature of our economy and how, you know, how, how large, how physically large our, our country is, um, often efficiencies are an important component of transactions that are being brought before the Bureau in Canada. So again, we're keeping an eye on this, um, on this draft and, and what ultimately the Bureau will put out as its guidance for how to apply the, the efficiencies defense to transactions in Canada. Okay, great. I think that's about all the time that we have for questions. So Cassie, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks very much for having me.